to another edition of Super 7, a show where we speak to a current or former rider and ask him about his dream team, his ultimate side, his Super 7. My name is John McGilvery. And I'm Liam Rudden. And yeah, welcome along to the final episode of the first series. And it's a festive episode to boot. We've got a very special guest tonight who will be telling us his dream team. Picked from either as maybe a childhood favourite in there, or it might be a trusted teammate, or maybe um, whoever they are, they're all good ones, I can tell you that. John, do you want to introduce our guest, our special festive guest? Yes, we have the uh, a, a four-time Scottish Open champion, um, a man of many tracks in the UK, and the current British title holder. We have Rory Schlein with us. Rory, thank you for joining us on Super 7. No worries, good to be here, Matt. Brilliant. Um, Rory, um, obviously we have to talk about the, the main thing that's happened this year. Who would have thought that uh, spending a year delivering parcels to the wrong addresses would have set you up just nicely for winning the British title? Uh, we all know, we can all, we've all heard how it's, it's felt to you, but what did it mean to you to win that? Uh, it, yeah, um, you know, not, not having won, it, won a National Australian final, uh, you know, it was sort of one thing that was sort of missing and uh, we drifted away, obviously, and, and then jo chose to to race in the British final after you know spending so much time here. And um, look, the circumstances are just unexplainable with with COVID and and all that sort of stuff. And riders unable to attend, and riders choosing not to ride. So you know, the, you'll always be remembered as a as a final that just you know was a bit of a makeshift. You know, they it was supposed to be used as one of the pilots to test for fans coming in and. But at the end of the day, it was still a championship. And, um, you know, uh, like we joke, yeah, the best preparation of delivering parcels. I've, I've been doing it wrong for years. I should have been delivering parcels years ago. Who knows where it would have got to. So, um, no, but it, it was just, it made this year a little bit better to, to deal with and, and um, something, you know, I, I can always look back on, you know, as the years roll on. Yeah, it was meant to be your farewell season um, in British Speedway, um from a selfish point of view, thankfully you'll be back for 2021. 20, uh, um, what does the, the future hold then? What, what, how have your plans changed? Uh, obviously, we, we're going to be staying um, another another year, obviously. Uh, with what we've got prepared and what we're looking forward to is still a bit of a mystery. I think everyone's trying to prepare for next season. I, I have agreed to, to, you know, come back for, for Wolves and Somerset if, if and when we do go... Uh, racing again uh, but in the meantime you know we're just going to con continue working with Hermes and and just see, see just see what happens and um, you know I think that's all we can do really just sort of week by week. Rory you've been next year will be will that be your 20th anniversary racing in the country and uh, when you look back does it seem like 20 years? Uh, well yeah well this year was supposed to be the 20th year um, I don't think in class three meetings as a season but um, yeah, next year will be 21 years more or less racing here in the UK or, you know, in Europe. Um, and it will just, you know, it, you know, me and John talk quite a bit, you know, how, how far I've come and he, he's coming like, you know, where we were, you know, years and years ago. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. And, um, but then I look myself in the mirror and see all the gray hairs and, uh, you know, it, uh, then, then, it, then it hits home. Just a reminder, Rory, how did you and John meet? Because you've known each other for a long time. Uh, I, I uh, got introduced to, to John through my dad and his mum. She... Uh, well, <laughs> Not like that, guys. The one in the room going around like that, no? No, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to my brother? <laughs> we, yeah, not, not to introduce that way, yeah. Um, not an arranged marriage or anything, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> No, and uh, I was looking for sponsors and, and it was John's mum who, who kindly said she'd sponsor me for the year and obviously got to meet John through 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 Penny and, um, you know, ever since then we've been best of mates and uh, the things we've done and the things we've seen and, and uh, you know, he, he introduced me to all his mates and, you know, it, it gave me uh, that sort of uh, part away from Speedway, which, you know, I think I needed and, and you know, I met so many great people and, um, you know, and the fun we've had, and we're continuing to have. We don't get to see or catch up as much as often anymore. But you know, it'll uh, don't worry. I'll, I'll get his backside over to Oz soon, <laughs> and um, yeah, we'll, we'll get him tanned up. 
Well, I can tell that you had a lot of fun together over the years because it, I think you're the only guest that John ever gets nervous about because he never knows what you're going to say next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, let's move on to your seven. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, what's been your thought behind uh, putting this one to seven together? It's a bit of one of these where it's a real mixture of riders. Uh, we've got Australians, we've got Englishmen, we've got Poles, uh, we've got a Russian in there as well. Um, what's been your thought process behind this? Um, mainly, it, it was due to part well. I have ridden with quite, well, most of them, really. Um, uh, personal experiences, uh, seeing what they've done firsthand, being on the opposite, <laughs> opposite, you know, end of, of, of what these guys have sort of done to me, as in, like, you know, passing me or, or beating me or whatever. It, it, the, these guys that are in this one to seven are, are who I just think are the best at what that, that position is. Not necessarily we'll go into averages and stuff, but I just think, you know, in certain teams, they need a certain type of rider, and I just believe these this seven is what, what it is. Your first rider, um, you're staying in your homeland of Australia. Yeah, who is number one then in your team? Uh, my number one is Jason Crump. Um, probably one of the most dominating uh, league riders ever to, to race, uh, not just in England, but... Uh, in, in all leagues, um, I, I didn't get a chance. I'm pretty sure Jason still holds a record for con the most consecutive maximums in a top flight uh, British league. I don't know what year it was. Um, I think it was in the old the old format in the old league, but it, he he was such a dominant number one. Um, and, you know, I couldn't think of anyone better who you'd want to go at heat one and get you off to a flyer. Um, aggressive uh, and again I've ridden with him I, I've seen him bring people bring the best out in people um, and when you've got a lad on the line as well Jason was able to do it so um, and always a team player as well always lending bikes and all sorts of stuff so you know he, he is you know just has to be a must number one Obviously when you were coming up Rory um, he was a rider who was probably certainly not far from the top of his game, but certainly getting up there and was going to be that dominant rider. When you joined the Australian setup, he was there as well. How big an influence was he in your early part of your career? Um, well, I did, uh, obviously, when I was, I was riding for Edinburgh, then, then signed for Bellevue. Jason was there, and there was a couple of other Aussies there, but Jason was there, and it was at that time we were just banging on the door of under-21s and getting noticed and stuff like that. And Jason was very good at... at um, getting inside my head where probably where my dad and my mechanic couldn't. Um, obviously having a similar relationship with his dad, um, I was able to relate to Jason, you know, with that. And, um, you know, it just, I think it was just, I'd grown up with Jason, especially back in Australia as well. And, you know, looked up to him. So when I had the opportunity to race with him and all that, and then it come to that stage when after, you know, racing with him, I moved away to Coventry and then, then it was sort of, well, we're rivals now. And, um, you know, the, the battles myself and Jason had were, were pretty pretty mega. And, uh, you know, you only have to see what, what they were like, at, you know, at the Peter Craven and, and uh, the British final, you know. Um, you know, we're still battling now, you know. I wouldn't have thought, you know, for years that I'd be doing it, you know, after he retired. So I had a bit of a uh, funny feeling, really, like, like in my stomach, you know, going to the line with him, you know, because I'd never, just never dreamed that I'd ever race against him again. And, um, yeah, but it was cool. It was a cool feeling, and uh, but yeah, number one, probably the best number one I've ever seen. You know, in all, in all leagues. Rory, of course, um, Jason's dad was Phil. Your dad was Lyndon. Um, what are the pros and cons of having a dad who was in the sport before you, who was a rider before you? Were? Uh, I, I think the the pros, obviously, because both both of us, both our dads were, you know. Riders, um, where dad dad did a bit of like did did do speedways and solos and and but it was mainly sidecars but did do solos and um, me dad and actually Phil did race against each other once at a long track meeting. Um, can't remember where it was, but they 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 did race against each other. Um, but it, it's a father and, and son relationship is good in ways and and sometimes bad in another because it, it 
you're, you're living together, you're, you're traveling together, you know, you, you're just always around each other. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it does boil over, you know, every father and so doesn't matter what it, you know, you read about Tiger Woods and his father, you know, they say they're late, but they, there's always, them, you know, boiling over points. Um, and, uh, but I just think that you both care. He wants best for you and you want to do as good, you know. Um, so I always thought, you know, I probably wouldn't be where I was if I didn't have my old man um, doing what he did and with all the advice and, and knowledge he has. He, even today, you know, I, I ring him up and uh, chew his ear off about certain things and, and uh, he's just always good to, you know, talk to. Um, he might be old school, but, you know, I'm, I'm always a believer in, in, in old school tricks still work. So, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, I've been very grateful, you know, to have that knowledge, you know, from a very young age. Um, and uh, the same as like both my granddads with all the knowledge they had, you know. So, um, you know, it's uh, it, just, I think, a lot more pros than cons, that's for sure. Uh, there's nothing too. There's nothing too wrong with old school, Rory. Um, number two, you come to the UK. Uh, you've got a rider who's a former British under twenty one champion and a former British champion. Who do you have at number two? Uh, I have Danny King as my number two. Um, he, to me, I got to race. I've been racing against Danny for years and years. We've had a few ding dongs actually. So, as in, like you know races where we've ended up on our backside. Uh, but I got to race with Danny uh, in 2017, 2018 um, uh, at Ipswich. And I've, I've said this before, probably the most enjoyable and fun year I had was 2017. After the, the years I'd had, you know, with injuries and stuff like that and, you know, not getting on with certain clubs and stuff, just to go to Ipswich and that morale in that club was next to none I haven't the only one I could compare would be the Coventry uh, treble and obviously the Edinburgh Monarchs in 03 um, but me and Danny have had a have had a really good relationship throughout the years we get on really well we race you know when we race against each other we race hard we race fair um, but I just really enjoyed the relationship I had with Danny that them two years we had a great understanding especially in heats 13s and 15s and we would laugh and joke and um, it, it really wore off on, on the other guys on the team as well. And I think for a team that got to every final it, that year, it was just so disappointing that we didn't win anything because I think we deserved it. Um, as in, you know, just the way we we ran that year. We just, well, I felt we needed some sort of silverware, you know, the effort and the, the emotion that everyone had put in, especially the, the semi-final at Edinburgh. That was, uh, that was such a team effort that didn't come down to one person that night at Edinburgh that was a team effort because not many people know what was going on in the pits you know throughout them races and um you know and Danny was was a big was a big part of that and uh that's why you know he's, he's in my one to seven. What difference does it make Rory having somebody like Danny in the pits you know you've got him on track he works on track but what, what does he do in the pits that makes him makes it important to have him there? Uh, just the feel good factor. He makes you, it just makes you feel good about yourself. Um, you know, I think we have that same sort of uh, reaction to each other. But every time, even when I'm racing against Danny, I, I, you know, we have a chat and we have a joke and we keep in touch, you know, by WhatsApp and send funny messages and all sorts all the time. And, um, you know, it's always just good to catch up with him. You know, it's always, you know, just make, you know, it's just enjoyable, you know, to see him, you know, just some, someone you can talk to and laugh with and, and uh, you know, again, like I say, I was lucky enough to, to race with him and uh, and just have, have so much fun. And I need that year was I couldn't have asked for someone else better that year um, because, you know, what we were coming off, off the back of. So, um, yeah. You, I remember talking to you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when you first made the step up to the Elite League, Rory, and I was like, you know, what are the differences? And you'd said to me, well, it's like the Premier League, but just not as fun much more serious. Um, with someone like Danny, does it take that kind of serious edge off it and allow you to have the fun that you maybe had um, previously? But I think so, yeah. It, um, you know, because like when, when, when it, I was thinking, obviously there was a few years I was trying to drop down and just it never happened. But when it finally did and then I got a phone call from Chris Louis, you know, uh, and then they said Danny's there and, I didn't even think about it. You know, I just thought, 
yeah, sign me up. I'm, I'm there. And, you know, and then they started telling me about the team and then that. And then I think it was our first, might have been our fun day. I can't remember, you know, uh, but straight away, it, it just, the first day when we were, I caught up with all the lads and Danny was there, it just felt good. It felt right. You know, just the atmosphere was good from the first day. Sometimes teams take a while to gel and, and, and build up, but um, that year in 2017, just everyone got on and everyone just had such a great time. And, and um, yeah, it just, he, I think he lifts everyone. I, I, I just, he brings that kind of atmosphere throughout the whole team. So we go to number three then, and we're heading for a six time world champion. Um, a big hitter at number three. Who do you have? I have uh, the one and only Tony Rickardson for, for, for number three. Um, he will go down, well, he will go down as one of the greatest, probably the greatest, you know, I don't think you can compare him and Ivan against each other, but definitely in the modern era, probably the greatest field rider of all time. Um, never had the pleasure of racing with him, nor uh, I, I raced against him in one meeting in Sweden, but didn't actually race against him in a heat race. And, um, but, you know, I'd seen him race live quite a few times and, I think, you know, some of the, the, the championships he won speaks for itself. You know, his race at Cardiff. Um, some of the things, oh, you know, we've just seen him do over the years. You, you, there's just nothing you can or you, more say about the guy. Um, he was sort of my idol from from very young age. I think, I think you, if you remember, Tony used to, was one of the first purple, people to bring the purple out. And uh, that's, who, that's where the purple sort of comes from. Um, so you know, always been a always been a hero of mine, and I was lucky enough to um, to race in his farewell at at Paul. Um, and I thought it was that that meeting. I thought finally I'll get to race against my hero, and um, he pulled out of his last race, which had me in it. <laughs> <laughs> he knew it was so, coming, mate. Huh? Yeah, he knew it was yeah, coming. It was, it, it was gut wrenching, absolutely gut wrenching. <laughs> was. Um, but um, yeah, just just you know to have watched him and um, met him, met him like you know spoke to him a few times, and uh, you know just a pleasure. What was it like to meet him? You know, there's that old saying. I think we've said this before on the show that you should never meet your heroes. So what was it like to actually meet Tony? Um, I think I met him. Uh, just trying to remember the first time I met him. Jesus, this is bringing show my old age now. I had some posters. Someone got some posters signed for me once when I was younger and had them up on my, on my wall. But I think I met him maybe down at Paul, I think, and he was with Antonio Limbach. And I, I, they were walking through the pits. I don't even think I was riding. I think I was watching. And, um, I was just, you know, just in awe. I, I you know, sh not shaken, but I just didn't have the, you know, <laughs> the balls to go up and ask him or anything like that. It was just... Um, but then, you know, as you grow up and get older, and, and I think I, I bumped into him a few times at the airports and stuff like that. So um, probably someone I would have liked to have spent more time with, like even more to have raced with. But, um, you know, it, uh, just, you know, just to see him and have to say I've met him. And, um, and, and again, the pleasure I got to race in his farewell in, uh, in England. Him had said um, you should never meet your heroes. He was talking about James Greaves. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I... I uh, well, no, hang on. You, you, that's someone else's hero, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, sorry, Liam. You're going to go into number four. All right. <laughs> we're going to go into number four, and we're going to go to Poland, an eight times Polish champion, uh, another former world champion. Who do you have at number four? Uh, number four, I've got Thomas Gollum. Uh, obviously, I know he only won the world championship once, and, you know, everyone, you know, no, Smarzlik's won it twice, but for me at the minute, still Poland's greatest ever sphere rider. Um, I, I, had, I had the pleasure and honour to, to race with him in Sweden at Harmerby in I think it was 2011, 2012. Um, and, uh, and I was parked next to him every night. And uh, just uh, to, to watch him, you know, like, as they say, being in his, you know, in his office chair and um, there was one night where we were away at Vestavik uh, and it was really, really tight. Thomas had been struggling uh, for a while, like a couple of meetings. And he went, we were going back to his old club at Vestavik where he rode the year before. And 
I've never seen someone dominate and make world class riders look second rate. Uh, I remember the Heat 13 and Heat 15. I'm sure I think it was 15. He came from last to first at Vestavik, which is very hard to do. Um, and I, I walked away just think, yeah, that for me, it's just not. It's not possible. Some of the things I've seen him do that night were just unreal. Um, and you know, vice versa, what we've seen him do. Oh, I think the movie put on Jimmy Nielsen in the uh, the Grand Prix at Rotslav. I think it was. I don't know what year was it? '99 or 2000. I can't remember. But just some moves he's done. Only someone with imagination like of Thomas could pull some of these moves off. And uh, to see it and to ride with him as well. I got the team ride with him a few times. And and um, again, just uh, the same like Jason, just in awe. Uh, and Tony, it was it was so cool to to have raced with him and against him. I think the first time I raced against him, I nearly killed him. I think and it was in a World Cup at Ribnik. I um I picked up some un, unwanted and unnecessary grip and uh, speared across the corner and nearly wiped him out. Uh, and that was a, my first meeting with Thomas. Um, so, but uh, I, I, I had a good relationship, especially with his his manager Thomas as well. Uh, his name is Thomas as well. I got a, got on really well with him and um, yeah, really enjoyable and fun times. Do you keep in touch with him, Rory? Do you keep in touch with Thomas? Um, obviously, he's not since the accident. So I've more or less kept in touch with the, with his manager, Thomas, who who now works at Grugens. I've kept in touch with him here and there, and um, and it's just more just you know, a general catch up. I think I, I I rang him up just to see how Thomas was doing, and he kept a lot you know close, you know, because it was at the time of the accident and stuff like that. It's um, you know Thomas keeps pretty low key these days. I know he was he was uh, a bit unwell. Uh, a while back, um, but I, I believe he's on the men now. So, um, but you know, it's it's you know, riders move on and do other things and stuff like that. You know, and I don't spend much time in Poland anymore anymore. So it's not like we can get catch up a lot. So, um, but yeah. Ironically, it was a motocross accident that that ended his career. I mean, how big a loss was he to Speedway? That was in 2017. Yeah, well, he was obviously getting towards the end of his career. We, ever, I think everyone knew that, but it was it was a similar phone call, like you know, similar phone call I had, you know, here finding out about, um, you know, Lee Richardson. You know, someone had told like I was on the phone and someone told me, and I was just, I was just, you know, we'd gone through these years of, you know, having these, you know, even down to Lee Adams. You know, I think we were on the plane one year. And we got everyone got a phone call. And we were in Sweden, and everyone said, oh, "You know, we heard about Lee." And it's a very, it was a very similar situation. And it just, yeah, just gut wrenching, really. You know, to just you know, to lose a talent like that, you know, we'll never see again. And um, and uh, you know, just yeah, just gut wrenching. You know, when there's so much talent there, we know. Like I said, I know he was getting to the end of his career, but you never know. He might have one or two more years to. To entertain us all, you know, he was still doing that at Grugin. Some of the races he was doing there were, were absolutely insane. Yeah, I read in the Speedway Star um, as well that he'd landed in hospital with coronavirus. Um, you know, as if this whole thing isn't bad enough. Uh, we end up with that. You know, someone who, who had a, a serious injury, um, thankfully, Rory, for you, you were able to get back on a bike. Um, it, it drives home, I guess, how serious. Um, the sport is in terms of injuries. Um, you know, you mentioned Lee Richardson there, and, and it's sad that sometimes the guys don't walk away. Um, it won't be something that plays on your mind um, when you're racing, but sometimes when you sit back and uh, you know you think maybe oh, you know it's a tough sport, and I'm lucky that I am where I am. Um, I, every day, uh, I thank my lucky stars because we were, you know, I think I've said it before we. The surgeon gave me 50-50 before um, I went into theatre, whether I'd walk again or not. So, um, you know, the, they were some pretty dark times, you know, just from the accident, going to the hospital. Um, it, I can't describe the pain because it, 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 it's impossible to, to describe it. Uh, the, the emotion, knowing that, you know, you were laying there and had, you know, no feeling in your legs and, and you thought you did, and then all of a sudden they're, they're testing you and they're pricking your foot, and then they're you, well, we've pricked your foot, and you, you didn't react, and you think, you, yeah, it, it, no, you could say an emotional roller coaster, but more of a, 
uh, reminder of what we guys do when we go to the tapes four or five times a night. You know, that's what we're putting on the line. And, you know, some, you say some are unlucky, you know, not to walk away, but then some are, are they don't walk away at all, as in, the, you know, you never see them again. And, um, but we know, we know the risks. Um, we've known them since we were young. You know, we grew up with the risks from a very, very young age. Uh, would I change anything? Would I encourage if I, you know, if I had a son or, you know, say a daughter who wanted to do motorsport, if they wanted to do it, I'd back them um, because I believe motorsport, whatever motorsport is, is a fantastic sport. And I think it only breeds uh, positivity. Uh, it teaches a lot of life lessons that you don't necessarily learn in, in school and especially the way, the way society are going now. Um, you know, motorsport in general is a great life lesson learned. Um, you know, going through the ups and downs, learning how to win, learning how to lose. Just everything that comes with it is, is such a, you know, positive thing to have in anyone's life. Yeah, I think um, as well, you need to be a certain type of person to do what you guys do. You know, I, 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 I could never do. Uh, I'd love to. I've had a, a kind of shot in a one two five. I've never had a shot in a 500. I couldn't do what you guys do. I couldn't fly into a corner with three other nut jobs wanting the same bit of track as me. I couldn't do it. Um, so it takes a kind of certain person to do it. And you're right with motorsport. You know, you watch MotoGP and you see these guys uh, that are going 100 odd miles an hour. Yeah, they've got brakes but they're still doing 150, 160 miles an hour. It's, you know, it takes a certain type of person um, to do that. And I think motorsport gives an outlet, whether it be motorcycle speedway or that, for these guys to do that. Yeah, it's, it's discipline as well. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, different in a sport, you know, you, you go and train, you go and practice. It, 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 it generates and teaches you discipline and, and you learn from your mistakes and you, you, you progress, you, you better yourself and, and then you develop that, I want to get better. I want to do that. So how do I get better? So you've got to learn. You've got to learn different, you know, whether it's mechanical or, you know, whether it's physical, you know, down in the, to nutrition. So, you know, and with motorsport, you never stop learning. You ne well, I think mate, we'll probably still go with any sport, but you just never, ever stop learning. And I, I'm 36 and I'm still learning things now. Um, and it, it won't stop, you know. Um, I think every athlete will say that you never, never stop learning. So that's why I think sport or motorsport in general is such a brilliant, brilliant industry to be involved in. Well, we'll go back to your one to seven here, Rory, and we've got a cracker at number five. Um, I'm looking forward to this one. Um, who have you got at five? Well, seeing how uh, I spent, well, when I first, before I'd even come to England, I'd watch this guy. Uh, I'd warn the tape. You, you didn't. You came to Scotland, mate. <laughs> before I come over, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I watched this guy on tape, uh, and I, I think I wore the tape out um, before I even got to got to Scotland. Um, and uh, so my number five is Peter Carr. Um, yeah, uh, I had a, like, had a, this thing, image of Peter in my mind, you know, before I come over and I just thought how this guy rides his track so, so well and he's so dominant and, um, he, uh, just, I don't know, he, he wore off on me very quickly, uh, and I looked up to him because I just thought what he did around Armadale was just no one else could do. Um, and my goal was just to try and get in somewhere in near him uh, as in you know to learn how to ride that place really really well because I thought you know if your home form is really good it wears off on you on or rubs off on your waveform so um I'd watched him and watched him and watched him on videos and uh, I can still watch him now on videos you know what he did there you, you say you learned a lot of Peter was he a nurturing rider when he was working with younger riders no <laughs> <laughs> uh Peter Peter was, um, I got to, I, I raced with him, teamed with him at three. He was at three, I was at four in 2003 when we won the league, I believe. And um, I think we all we all know Peter wasn't the best gator. Um, but when he when he was on it, he could, re, he could gate. He actually could gate when he was on it. Um, but there were many a times where I'd find myself in front of Peter 
and Peter wanted to go faster, uh, and Peter would would force the issue and politely push me into the corners quicker than I wanted to go. Um, but it wasn't until after, like maybe at the end of the season, a few years gone by, um, I realised that helped. That that pushed me to go faster. That that pushed me to go quicker. Um, and it was a good gauge, really. And, uh, you know, he, he, even around Sheffield, you know, when we went to Sheffield, he was fast around there. So, you know, he was a good gauge on to know where, how quick you were going and, um, and learned quite a bit, of, you know, with setups as well. He, he, was, he was good in that, in, in that way. Um, but he probably, he probably wasn't teaching me on purpose, but in, in, in hindsight, he probably was, uh, as in, you know, just, that I was watching him all the time and, and, and the way he sort of rode with me. Um, but I think he did that with other riders as well. He, he pushed other riders on, you know, um, and uh, he had such good bike ability and control. He could, he could do that. He could push a rider and not, you know, get, get really close to you and, and not, you know, scare you or, um, uh, or you know, make you crash. So, um, and uh, yeah, just, just unbelievable rider, especially around Armadale. So a bit, a bit of tough love, maybe, on track. Yeah, a little bit. I, I remember the, the, I remember the first time I beat him, straight up, one on one, and it was in the 2004 Scottish Open, and um, I, I signalled to him going over the start finish line as I beat him, sort of hurry up, hurry, you know, uh, you know, and. Um, yeah, got a little clip around the ears back in the pits. Brought me back down to reality. Uh, so, um, but it didn't stop me. I went on and won that night. So, won my first got a show from that night. So, probably a good little clip around the ears, bring me back down to earth. And um, but I was just that was the first time I beat him straight up. And I, I think if he realises now, that was you know that was a big goal for me to to beat you know Peter around around Edinburgh. But um, yeah, just he's another one I looked up to. I, I looked up to him. More when I got there, it didn't as if I looked up to him before I got there, like Jason and Tony and that. I looked up to him when I got there, and then re when I saw it, you know, you know, in real time, how good he was around Edinburgh, um, and uh, yeah, and just um, a very, a very quiet uh, and humble guy, you know, like he just never really, you know, he didn't say a lot. He did it. He did it. He did all his talking on the track. I do remember that 2004 Scottish Open win, Rory. I was very drunk that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a big night. I, I believe I'd blown my engine up the week before, uh, a brand new engine. And every dime I won from that night went to the repair build of that engine. <laughs> so it wasn't too much celebrating. It was more just repair everything. <laughs> okay then, Rory. At number six, we go back to your homeland, back to Australia. Who do you have at number six? Uh, at the first reserve spot, I have Darcy Ward at number ah. six. Um, yeah, a, a guy that that uh, was taken from the sport way, you know, unfortunately. Um, and someone who I did get to race with uh, a little bit um, and obviously raced a lot with him, against him uh, here in the UK and, and abroad. Um, and probably the, one of the most talented riders I've ever seen, ever. Uh, I know people say there may be, you know, like Pearl Johnson and stuff like that, and Hanky Gustafsson, like, but me personally, probably the most gifted, talented guy who, who, when he did, when he did take it like seriously and, and worked at it, would no doubt, you know, put me house on, he would have, he would have been a world champion, um, you know, and just the way how good he was when, when he was sort of, you know, only maybe at 50% uh, enthused, enthused into the sport. Uh, but, yeah, just an unreal talent that I don't think, I think will be years away from seeing again. Rory, what, what made him so special? I mean, is it an instinct that he was born with? Was it something he learned? What, what made him stand out for you as a rider? Two things that I, I saw were, was his throttle control and his balance. He probably wasn't as flamboyant as, say, someone like Smarslik, but his body positioning with his throttle control, where he had to be, um, he could get grip 
where no one else could get grip. Uh, he did that a lot at pool. Um, he had this ability to, to get grip off, off absolutely nothing where there was numerous times where I was in, you know, in the dirt. There's, there's only way he's going around. There's only way he's going to get past me to go around me. And then the next minute he's nipping up the inside of me on the back wheel, um, uh, you know, give me a hand signal, you know, uh, just, yeah. Um, I got the chance to race with him a few times in England, but it was when I saw some wow moments was in Sweden where he he was running third and he was behind Emil. Um, I think it might have been Jura Campbell that, and Darcy found himself in a position where he, he was committed, but he actually got halfway around the corner, ended up on the back wheel and rode between them while on the back wheel, but then I was able to duck under, and I can't remember if it was Emil or, or Eric's handlebar, and then manoeuvre it through the gap. I, I had another, another moment where I just walked away and just thought, oh, God, you know, this is just unbelievable. I can't, how did, he, how did he do it? And I remember he'd come back in the pits and wasn't, he wasn't even blowing, blowing a puff. Um, and uh, I just shook my head, head at him and I said, go away. Um, you know, uh, yeah, and, you know, we had some right ding-dong battles with him, um, you know, obviously in England a few times. And, um, but, yeah, the year, um, it was a, obviously, personally, the year I did my back, he had his accident as well. And um, just someone I, 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 I admired, you know, just because of his talent and his ability. And uh, just someone enjoy, you know, I enjoyed hanging out with him as well. Yeah, Mark Lemon had said in our first show that he had no doubt that he would have gone on to win the World Championship and multiple, probably, um, World Championships. Um, do you, you know, do you still learn from someone like Darcy Ward when you're in a team with them or in opposition with them? Do you, do you still see these guys and think, well, well, I could pick something up from there or there? Or sometimes it just how does he do that? Um, there was quite a few times with Darcy. Just how, how he just, I, I just think it was just pure ability um, and, and instinct. Um, you know, I, you know, just to have, you know, half that that ability. I, I'd have loved to have what he had. Um, I always found I was a kind of rider. I had to work at it. Um, and uh, like him on a like you know probably do people do know but him on a motocross bike he could be competitive in motocross races that's how good he was on a motocross so just a motorcyclist himself was just you know he was brilliant on two wheels um, and he you know probably wasn't the best gator when he was you know his gating really did improve that year um, when he come back after his ban. Uh, I seen him at Coventry actually the, the the week before he had his accident, and his gating was so good, like really really sharp. Um, and I, I I had a word with him in the pits, and I, I said, "Mate, you keep this up, you know, just, just write you know write your own ticket." Um, and uh, you know, and that was the last time I obviously seen him ride. Uh, and I can still picture now just how good he was that night as well. And um, yeah, just. Just pure talent and ability. It's just unbelievable. So we're going to go to uh, Russia for your number seven. It's a fairly formidable top six that you've got so far. And how are you rounding off your super seven? Uh, well, my number seven is Emil Safdinov. Uh, he, um, for me, he, like he was a, a guy who burst onto the scene. I think he got third the first year in the, in the Grand Prix. Um, he, I think he won maybe three World Under Twenty One. He, him and Chris were were were, were uh, the two you know, time uh, two team World Under Twenty One. Yeah, now. two. Um, and uh, you know he he burst on the scene, got third the first year, I think, in his Grand Prix, you know, season, and and everyone sort of you know he was a wild child, he was loose, he was he was just not in control, and I liked it because it, it, at that time I think the Grand Prix needed just needed a wild child like a, a new Thomas Golub. And um, but over the years he's had some accidents and he's been that kind of rider. He's changed it like style has altered a little bit I think, and that's been down to his accidents. And now I I, I think he's like why well, I nicknamed him the the professor. You know he is just strictly business when he goes to races. Uh, he's smooth. He's calculated. He thinks about things. He's probably one of the most intelligent, right, like racing brains out there. Um, 
he knows when to make the move. Uh, and uh, some of his races, like, I think his race at Sweden in Kumla where he rode the fence, and he did the same thing at, at Chester Hover. So, you know, he can put it on the line when he wants, you know, when he has to. Um, but you just his, you know, uh, no BS and just strictly business kind of attitude. You know, they go to the track, they do their job. If the job's not, uh, it's not a good night, they just go away and then they go to the next one. They, they don't seem to let anything get to them. They just roll to the next meeting and, well, that one's done and dust. We can't change it. And they go to the next one and, and do the same, you know, you know, try and correct it the next week. You know, his outfit is probably as close as, as you will get to a Formula One setup, as in like the way their mentality is uh, and the way that they're, they're structured around each other. Um, something I really, really respect and, and, and admire what Emil has done, you know, just with his team and, and everything there. What kind of back does it, does it take to, to, to get that set up then, Rory? You know, you're saying it's run like a Formula One team. So, you know, how do you, how do you even start to begin that in a speedway team? Yeah, well, again, like you, we don't get, go off and turn them with, with like, you know, we don't want to go down the foot. But what I mean is he, everyone knows their job in, in his team. Uh, his equipment is just next to none. Um, you know, they got all the trick bits. They have people like they, they, they're always testing as well. Um, I constantly see online. He's always testing and always trying things. And, um, and he seems that kind of guy where, you know, if there's something new, he'll try it. You know, if it works, it doesn't, you know, OK, it doesn't. Then they'll try something else. Um, and uh, he he just has that mentality. I think he's got some good guys behind him. I think Susie's still with him, uh, who's once uh, with Tony Ricards, and I believe you know for a period of time. Um, so you know he and and Tony was one of them guys that first brought that mentality of a team setup. You know you know being so professional, like like a, a race car team. You know, um, and I think Susie may have you know embedded that into to Emil from a very young age, um, and he has been like that you know, for as long as I've known him, you know, just so professional. So, you know, I keep saying it, but business-like, you know, so, um, you know, where he goes, he's going to score you 10, 12 points every meeting, you know, are you guaranteed, you know, that uh, one of the most dominant riders in Poland for the last few years. And, um, you know, possibly underachieving at the minute in the Grand Prix, I think, I, I think, um, you know, that, Maybe some things need to be looked at differently. You know, he needs to approach the Grand Prix differently to league matches. You know, he, he has that sort of Lee Adams uh, vibe about him at the minute, like just do so dominant in the in the leagues, but just can't quite transform that that league form into, you know, constant uh, GP wins. Has he got the talent and potential to be a, a world champion, Rory? Oh, without a doubt. I think we've seen that the first year he, he you know, got... He was on the podium in his first year of the Grand Prix. He does have that. Um, I just think, you know, that there are times during the Grand Prix where I think you've got to throw it all out there. Uh, I think we've seen that from Smart. We've seen that from Ty. We've seen that from Doyle. Uh, Doyle, you know, bit him in the backside one year, cost him a world championship. Uh, but I mean, like, there, there comes that time where when you're going for your first world title, I think it looks like you have to maybe take a few risks, take a few chances. Um, and you know that that's why I sort of say Emil's like, like Lee Adams a little bit. He has that sort of calculated. He he analyzes everything before he goes into it, and uh, um, but it, it's there. You know, one year it could click, and 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 then then that could be it. You know, the the the, the horse will bolt mode most likely. You know, bit like what Smarzlik's doing at the minute. You know, so everyone's playing catch up with him. Uh, I don't think people realise how far Smarzlik's gone. You know, I think Smarzlik's on a different planet, even to tie at the minute, I just think. Uh, but Emil does have that. He has that ability to, to be that dominant in the Grand Prix. You know, maybe the, it's just that one small thing missing. Do you think you're, you're saying that about Smarzlik being, um, being a step ahead of everyone else? Um, do you think he's got that kind of dominance that he can do it for the next you know, five, six, seven years and, you know, a bit a kind of like Lewis Hamilton, but not as a boring sport. Um, and do you think he could do that for the foreseeable? I think so. If, if someone like um, Ty and Doyle and maybe Emil don't, you know, latch onto him, I think I think he could just run away with it. I think if, if he does, if no one doesn't latch onto him, I think Tony's and Ivan's record could be, could be at risk, uh, you know, because I just think he, he is so focused and, you know, just seeing him the way he operates now, you know, uh, I watched him at the beginning of the year and he didn't look 
right. He just didn't look and but you know, no one really knew, but he was trying things and testing things, getting ready for the for the Grand Prix. Um, you know, the things you don't see. Uh, and then when he did get to the Grand Prix, he was just like I said, just on a just another another level. Um, and that's what, you know, we roll back, we go back to Tony and Jason, them errors there was it was Tony and Jason, then there was another cluster of riders, and then Gollum, you know, got up to that level. And, um, it was it, at the minute I only see um, Smarzy in that that bracket. Uh, Ty Doily and 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 them will have that ability, but I just think he's just started to pull away. And if they don't latch on, I think um, he'll be hard to pull back. Okay, and you've got a strong team there, Rory. Some great characters, some very dominant characters. Who do you put in charge of them all? Who is the man that can keep them all together and get the best out of them? Um, having ridden for a lot of clubs, <laughs> uh, I've ridden under a lot of managers, um, but I always find with, with Speedway, it's about man management because once the guys get on the track, there's not a lot a manager can do. Um so the best man manager I've been under is Pete Adams. Uh, and what makes, him, what makes him different to the others, Rory? Um, he, he's able to talk to every rider individual, like differently. He, he knows how to talk because every rider is different. They react like, you know, th there's a time and a place to, to, to pull, on, like, pull on him. Uh, to poke him, to to try and get the best out of him. He he seems to have that. Um, <clears throat> personally, with me, he get he on he's one of the best managers to get the best out of me, um, and someone who I can speak with, uh, treat you like you know. Now that I'm a captain, he 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 talks to you like a captain, and and, and he respects what you've got to say. Um, and uh, I've watched him, you know, over the you know with what he did with. With um, Ty Wolfenden, you know, he was uh, Bruce Pennell's manager years ago as well. Um, he's able to uh, just, you know, if, it, if he's a Larry, Lowry, you know, you know, loud kind of guy, he's able to, he has a calming influence on, you know, if he's a bit of a quiet guy, like, you know, you've got someone like um, uh, Frederick Lingren who hardly says anything, you know, I've ridden with Freddie and, um, it's hard to get, you know, just a sentence out of him, let, you know, let alone a word. It was just, so Pete was able to talk to him and have that ability, you know, you'd actually go sit off in a corner with him and have a coffee with, with, with Fred, because that's what Fred did. So Pete would go and join him and talk to him and, you know, find out what's going on. And then he'd come and talk to me and have a joke and a laugh and, and you know, get, you know, you know be, be a completely different type of person, you know, but, but still Pete Adams in, in the same, but just... Uh, Knowing how to approach each rider individually, I think that's what makes Pete, you know, one of the best managers I've ever ridden under. So it's all it's all about the psychology. Then you need to be a bit of a psychologist. Um, yeah, I just think you, you, uh, I think to read people as well, you know, just uh, judge them, you know, their characters, and you know, and just how to approach them, you know. I, I, you guys would see, you know, when a rider comes in, you know, throwing the helmet on the ground, or you know. You know, or some that just disappear and you can't find them. Pete just has that ability to just, you know, there, there's no writer he can't talk to and get, you know, the, the end product out of, you know, and uh, that's where I think his strengths are. You know, I think tactically he's good as well. Uh, I've seen that firsthand. Um, but definitely strength is just, you know, he's able to talk to his writers and, and uh, get the best out of them. So you've got your team, you've got your manager, they're all lined up to go on track. What do you call them? What's the name of your team, Rory? You, you ask me this, I don't know. I'll just, I'll just say Rude Boy 7, I guess. <laughs> and you, you would need a, a skipper for Rude Boy 7, mate. Who would be your captain? Um, I would make Danny King my captain, uh, purely just because of, you know, that the, you know when I raced under him at, uh, at Ipswich, um, you know, just fantastic year. Uh, and... The relationship I had with him, you know, the the just everything about that year, Danny just moulds just a captain. You know, he might not be the best rider in, in your team, but he is he is someone you need in your team. Um, you know, they always say like someone like you know Solskjaer who played for United didn't you know he was a super sub, but he was like he, he's someone you just need in your team to 
to make it all. <laughs> Not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, we'd also, uh, when it comes to eight fifteen, you need two riders out there. Um, who would be the two that you'd want to go out to get that five one? You know what I'm going to ask. I need to know what track and what the track conditions are like. I need to know. <laughs> you and I, Liam, we just say right. Well, he's a good rider. He's a good rider. Go. Yeah, they'll do. They'll exactly. do with the turn. These speedway riders keep coming up. Going, oh no, well maybe him. I, what if the track yeah, was it, wet? What was a yeah, all, all you, the all you fans and supporters and, and, and critics, you, there's more to it than just, you know, oh, just t- put two riders out there and go. There's, there's more to it. Can he do it oh, on do a cold Tuesday in Somerset? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would put in a scenario at Edinburgh, Heat 15 against Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> Um, I would I would put um, Jason Crump off the inside, and I put Peter Carr off the outside. Ooh. Oh, good, good. Oh, that's at Edinburgh. Right. That's at Edinburgh. That's <laughs> Let me throw another one at you that hopefully doesn't depend on the track you're on. But um, of the seven that you've picked there, who's the team rider? Who's the one that you would trust with a with maybe a a less experienced rider to shepherd them round? Darcy Ward, straight away. Darcy Ward, probably one of the best team riders I've ever seen. Um, you would, I put him up there with the with the Americans, uh, Bobby Schwartz and Dennis Segalis and Bruce Pennell, all them guys. That you go back, the all Americans back then were brilliant, brilliant team riders. Um, definitely Darcy Ward. If you if you needed someone to sh- chaperone a rider around, he, he, he's your man. We got that. We were going to ask you. Rory, who your favourite centre green presenter was, but you said Scott Wilson, so we're not having it. We're going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sorry, Liam, on you go. You're going to introduce the ten questions. Yeah, we're going to do a quick, uh, quick fire ten questions. Number one, who's your favourite on green? No, wait a minute, we've done that one. <laughs> last time, when was the last time you were on a speedway bike, Rory? Um, it was. Uh... Oh, well, Peter Craven, obviously, this year at Manchester. Do you have a lucky or favourite helmet colour? Uh, no, not really. No, it doesn't really matter. Do you have a favourite gate to go off? It depends what the, what the gate is. Oh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 give, I'll give you one. I'll, um, uh, the groupiest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it tea or coffee? I know this one. Uh, tea first thing in the morning and coffee as I get as I get to work. Okay, if uh, you had not become a speedway rider, Rory, what would you have been? What you, what would your career path have been? A centre green announcer. <laughs> <laughs> There's no money in it, mate. <laughs> uh, I don't honestly know. I, I at the stage when I did leave school, I was getting into sort of graphic art and stuff like that. Uh, sign writing and stuff like that. I was learning that a little bit at school, so maybe something like that. Favourite pastime or hobby? Uh, probably just watching football, I reckon. Uh, number seven, a favourite film? Uh, Top Gun. I'd say Top Gun. It's up there. Nice. Okay, Goose. Uh, you're a race suit or a race jacket? Uh, a race suit. Okay, and second last question. What's the worst thing about Speedway? The worst thing about Speedway? Um, I think in all sports, I think politics, uh, you know, when they, you know, personal interests get in way of, of what, what the, what Speedway should be all about. So I'd say politics, yeah. And what's the best thing about Speedway? Just pure racing. I don't think I can say anything. It's just pure racing. Uh, you put the money aside and all that sort of stuff. There's nothing better than going sideways for four laps. And it's hard to describe to other people, you know, that feeling you get when you race. So, um, yeah, just that. Brilliant. Well, Rory, we've come to the end of our uh, Super 7 interview. It's been brilliant talking to you. This uh, will be as a festive special out on Christmas Eve. Um, do you have any plans for Christmas? Uh, yeah, we'll probably be spending Christmas uh, here. 
uh, just at home and, um, you know, we'd well, just, I think everyone would be the same, just a nice quiet one and and uh, might even fly the barbie up for, for old time's sakes for Aussie. <laughs> Rory, here's one that you're not, you're not expecting. What's, uh, what's been the worst Christmas present you've ever been given? Oh, God. Uh, don't know. Couldn't, oh. I don't know. Um, couldn't tell you. One with probably not, if, if not some of that, a year I didn't get a bottle of alcohol, that'd probably be it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've come to the end of our first season as well. We've had some brilliant guests, we've had some great interviews and some real insights into what would make a Speedway rider go into a fellow Speedway riders um, one to seven. Uh, we'll be back with a season two, Liam. We will indeed, and uh, I suppose this is a, a good time to thank everybody for their support on this one. Thank all the riders who have uh, spoke to us and shared their dream teams with us, and to everybody who's watched. Well, you know, that's why we do it. We do it for you guys. Hope you've all enjoyed the series, and well, we can't wait to get back next year, can we? We cannot. We cannot. We'll be back in 2021 with a season two. Um, Rory, you know my address. You work for a delivery company. I expect a big Christmas present then. Um, there's no excuses this year. Just just contact uh, customer services and they'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Rory, thank you very much. To everyone who's watched us through season one, uh, thank you very, very much. We've enjoyed it. I hope you have a great Christmas. I hope you have a brilliant new year. And certainly let's hope for some racing in 2021. From Liam, from Rory, from myself, thank you very much for watching Super 7. <laughs>